Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to be able to talk to you today. Uh, sadly, not here in person, uh, but uh, an opportunity for me to give you an update uh, with regard to growing sugar beet uh, with a UK perspective, particularly with the recent changes in agronomic practices uh, and the loss of the neonicotinoid seed treatments. So what I'd like to do is just highlight some of the challenges that we face, uh, highlight some of the pests and diseases that we all having to deal with, uh, but also then to turn to what happened in 2020, because in the UK, as well as several other European countries, virus yellows transmitted by aphids was a major, major problem for growing sugar beet uh, in the last 12 months. So uh, the slides are all in Danish, as you'll see, uh, but I will continue to speak uh, in English. Uh, but clearly, uh, as we all know, a decision was taken uh, by the uh, EU to withdraw the use of all the neonicotinoid C treatments, uh, and that came into effect uh, in 2018. So by the time we got to 2019, uh, this was the first year for all European sugar beet uh, producers uh, to grow the crop in the absence of the neonicotinoid seed treatments, whether that was amidacloprid, clothionidinin or thymethoxam. Uh, and so uh, we have having to deal with the challenges for the first time in 25 years uh, without such treatments. Now, we all know uh, that it is also possible for governments to grant emergency authorizations, and in some countries uh, that has been the situation, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as I go through my presentation. But the seed treatments really were very valuable in the fact that they stopped up to 15 different uh, European pests and diseases and provided a very uh, unique uh, and simple way for able to control these situations. So you can see in this slide uh, that they were able to control the soil pest complex very well, the combination of the neonicotinoid, often with a pyrethroid, things like springtails, symphalids, and millipedes. Uh, we also uh, are able to control uh, leaf miner, Pegamia bt, that can be a sporadic pest uh, across Europe too, uh, but the seed treatments were highly effective of controlling uh, aphids, particularly uh, Mysis persky, uh, the peach potato aphid, uh, but also uh, depending if they came into the crop uh, at a relatively early stage, the black bean aphid, aphis fabia as well. But I'll just very quickly look at specifically uh, these issues. So the soil pest problems are, are, are again ubiquitous across Europe. Uh, I, I appreciate that soil pests can be a major problem in Denmark and other parts of Scandinavia. And here is a nice example here in the UK uh, of using seed treatments for controlling uh, the, uh, the soil pest complex, uh, a trial from several years ago now, uh, but really important to try and protect uh, the growing uh, seedlings to ensure uh, establishment and a mature plant stand. Now, uh, in, in, in the UK, uh, as elsewhere in other parts of Europe, uh, often the, the neonicotinoid was available with a pyrethroid, such as tethruthrin. And actually in the UK, uh, tethruthrin is still available and is used by growers to try and limit the buildup uh, of the soil pest complex. But unfortunately, without such treatments, uh, we would struggle because uh, there are limited alternative approaches for controlling the soil pest complex. Uh, and actually soil pests, because they are a range of different species uh, and cause general root grazing, it's very difficult to be able to generate uh, varieties that offer tolerance or partial resistance uh, again against these. There are certain agronomic features uh, and practices that can be uh, encouraged. And one thing that we clearly do in the UK is try and avoid uh, and recommend growers not to grow beet after grass, which can actually increase the risk of soil pests. 
Now, another problem, as I've already highlighted, is uh, leaf miner, uh, Pegamia bt. Again, it can be found right across Europe, more of a sporadic problem. Uh, tends to have three generations, the first showing in, in May, June time, and the last generation, um, sometimes September, October time. Uh, the eggs are laid, they hatch, and the larva mine, and it causes this characteristic uh, leaf necrosis, uh, which can cause uh, a problem for yield uh, and uh, yield loss and sugar losses too. Now, uh, the, the treatments, uh, Again, we were relying on the seed treatments. There are additional other treatments that can be applied as sprays, such as the pyrethroids. Uh, but here in the UK, as I'm sure in, in Denmark, we try and avoid pyrethroids because often they will have a, 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 an impact on beneficial insects. We have done some work uh, in trials in recent years uh, and find that uh, from impact uh, of the second and third generation, they can cause yield losses of up to 9%, uh, which is of concern, uh, and clearly trying to control the first generation, which could have even greater yield impact, uh, is important. Uh, and <clears throat> we are also concerned about the first generation causing leaf mining, and, and leaf blistering that can have an impact on herbicides, uh, particularly in that early period of the season. Uh, and, and once again, although leaf miners are trying to develop varieties of the future that will provide tolerance or resistance, those are clearly not available for commercial use uh, anywhere in the near future. So further challenges that were faced uh, with the leaf miners that the seed treatments did an excellent job at. But what I'd like to concentrate on really uh, is, is, is virus yellows. Now, virus yellows uh, is not a new disease for any of us, uh, but I do appreciate in Denmark it can be more of a sporadic problem, uh, often associated with milder winters enabling uh, the aphids to uh, survive in, in live forms and migrate into the spring into newly sown crops. Now these are the characteristic symptoms of, of the viruses uh, causing uh, an impact on root growth, uh, shoot growth, uh, symptom expression uh, and uh, ultimately causing yield losses of anywhere between 50 uh, to 80 percent here in the UK in 2020. Now, vi virus yellows was caused by three different viruses, uh, beet mold yellowing virus and beet chlorosis virus. Uh, these are closer related viruses transmitted persistently by Mises persky, the peach potato aphid. Uh, and there is a third virus uh, that's known as beet yellows virus, a different, different type of virus, a costo virus that's transmitted semi-persistently. But all, all cause these characteristic yellow patches that in severe years can merge uh, and leading to whole fields turning yellow. Uh, and where the seed treatments provided excellent protection uh, for up to 12 weeks. So uh, aphids were not able to uh, reproduce. Aphids, winged aphids would land in the crop, they would feed, acquire the seed treatment and then die failing to produce progeny that would then potentially spread the virus. So really quite uh, a significant problem, particularly here in the UK, but also in parts of uh, uh, France, uh, the Benelux countries, and as I said, sporadically uh, further north into Scandinavia. Uh, we have done some collaborative research through the International Institute of Sugar Beet Research that my organisation, BBRO, closely collaborates with MBR. Uh, previous historic work has really shown where the, the major uh, epicentre of uh, epidemics have been. And as you can see, the maritime influence uh, with mild winters really shows it can be a, a big problem here in the UK and those other countries bordering the North Sea. Actually, in the UK, uh, we uh, have developed uh, a model that is able to forecast the incidence uh, of virus yellows before the crop is planted each year, although often that was 
uh, after when decisions had to be made with regard to seed treatments. Uh, this model really started over 60, 70 years ago and has evolved uh, since then, but takes into consideration winter temperature uh, on aphid populations. And then we are able to reflect on what's happened previously with the aphids, with particularly with the mean temperature in January and February, to give an indication in early March as to the levels of virus incidence with and without pest management strategies and also give an indication to agronomists and growers of when aphids are going to start to fly into the crop. And as we know, the later the aphids migrate into the crop, uh, the less of an impact they'll have on final yields. And this is nicely demonstrated with the next chart because we have, as I said, been using this tool really since the 1960s. Uh, the orange dotted line that you can see indicates the level of virus yellows indicated by the forecast in March, what would happen at the end of August each year without any pest management strategies available in that particular year. The blue line is showing the level of virus yellows predicted at the end of August with the best pest management situations available in each year. And then the blue dot is actually the level of observed virus yellows incidents counted by the uh, contract managers, the agronomists who work for British Sugar. So you can see really in the last 20 or so years, we would have had a number of epidemics, but you can also see the consequence and value of the seed treatments because they were introduced into the UK uh, in uh, 1994. Uh, uh, and really for the 25 years that they were used, we have really, really seen very little virus yellows through to 2018 because of their effectiveness of controlling the vectors spreading virus yellows. But having said that, and as I already highlighted right at the beginning, uh, we uh, did not use the neonicotinoid C treatments once they were banned uh, from 2019. And 2020 has really provided a major challenge in the UK uh, because of the conditions that growers had to face. So I'll now concentrate on what happened in the last 12 months and show you some of the challenges that we have in sugar beet production to try and limit the impact of things like virus yellows. So here in the UK 12 months ago, we had an incredibly mild winter temperatures were at least two degrees warmer in the January and February period, the key time that influences survival of, of aphids. That was compounded further in the fact that we had a very mild and warm spring, in addition to a very dry period in the same period. So aphids were able to survive throughout the winter and were able to migrate into crops really from late March onwards, just as UK growers are starting to sow the crop uh, and kept, uh, kept migrating throughout that period. So it provided the perfect conditions that we hadn't seen for a number of years. And this sadly all uh, uh, coincided with uh, not having those seed treatments. So growers were really having to struggle to try and combat early aphid migration and large numbers coming into crops which were relatively at a small growth stage. The virus forecast that uh, BBRO issued to the, the growers and agronomists in early March uh, already was able to indicate that without any pest management strategies between somewhere between 70 and 95 percent of the crop would go yellow without any control strategies uh, and without the seed treatments available. And as I said, this was all partly because the, the, uh, the temperature uh, in that period that's so influential was at least three degrees warmer in, in the sugar beet growing areas than it, it would normally have been, and at least two and a half degrees warmer than the, the previous forecast in 2019. So growers uh, in the UK only had one fully approved uh, insecticide to control aphids. So uh, growers had uh, the opportunity to apply Topeki 
or the active ingredient flonicamid for aphid control in 2020. Uh, the BBRO on behalf of the industry did apply for further emergency authorizations for products and were able to gain two applications of Biscaya or thiacloprid, which is the folia uh, neonicotinoid uh, thiacloprid, as I've said. And we also gained two additional sprays of a further folia neonicotinoid uh, acetamiprid in the sprays of Incyst and Gazelle. So growers did actually have a four spray program to try and limit the buildup. Uh, we try and avoid the use of pyrethroids and carbamates because we know from all the monitoring work that we do that 80% of the aphids are resistant to these products and they're also they cause problems to beneficial insects. There are currently no uh, tolerant or partial resistant virus yellows varieties available commercially yet. And so hygiene measures limiting the sources of infection and aphids was really a, a major push uh, to, to make sure that we could try and limit the buildup of these aphids. However, uh, I have worked uh, in sugar beet now for 32 years and I've never seen aphid numbers like these. Uh, these were photographs taken throughout the eastern regions and it wasn't difficult to find uh, plants with over 200 green winged, uh, wingless sorry, aphids on the crop uh, and it was very difficult even with the spray treatments that were available to control these aphids and unfortunately this led to widespread virus infection. We, we monitor aphid populations. We work very closely with the scientists at the Rothamsted Research Institute where they have a number of suction traps that are monitoring winged aphids. The BBRO also had a network of 50 yellow water pans that were run by agronomists uh, and some growers and those samples were sent into the BBRO for analysis. And we also did more detailed analysis of aphids on the crops, partly because of COVID, uh, to also to provide additional information. And this also then supported direct observations by growers and agronomists uh, into the BBRO. So we had a very detailed picture. This chart is actually one of the suction traps monitored by Rothamsted Research that's been in operation since 1965. Uh, and this indicates the annual level of Mises persicae, the peach potato aphid caught each, each year. And it really just goes to show uh, the unprecedented, unprecedented numbers of wing Mises persicae caught in 2020, up until the base reference uh, date of the 17th of June. We just never have seen such high numbers of aphids. You can see it has been increasing over recent five or six years. Uh, but this was a step change in the numbers of aphids and partly probably reflecting climate change and mild winters that we're now experiencing. In addition to this, we had the network of yellow water pans, uh, which we were able to use and these were all photographed uh, and some were analysed in the laboratory. But we were encouraging all these sites for growers to count the numbers of green wingless aphids on plants uh, twice a week. And this information was then sent to BBRO. We have a live uh, web page which is updated on, an, on a daily basis where we're able, able to indicate where aphids were being found and whether or not they were above threshold so that growers and agronomists could check these pages to supplement our own information on farm to then uh, trigger the use of the foliar insecticides uh, that they had at their disposal. But as you can see, this is just one of the sites. Uh, growers, we saw this happen at many of these sites. We had really high numbers of aphids in some situations, in commercial situations, over 200 at this particular site, even though the grower here applied three different sprays to tr at the threshold of one green wingless aphid, aphid per four plants that we have here and to try and limit the buildup. But because the, the sheer numbers that we were faced with, it was very difficult to control. And you can see that here uh, we did virus assessments also at all these sites. We were really getting at this particular situation around about 50% showed virus yellows at the end of August. 
and this was really quite typical of a number of sites in these regions. BBRO in my team, uh, we were looking at the efficacy of, of treatments uh, and clearly these data showed that the treatments that were available, such as Biscaya, Insist and Topeki, were effective. Uh, from our own trial experiences, uh, the comments that growers and agronomists made to us, but the sheer numbers of aphids sometimes meant that spray programmes had to be uh, shortened to try and keep on top and maintain uh, effective control of the green wingless aphids, which sometimes was difficult with weather patterns and trying to spray herbicides. But at least this did give some confidence that the treatments they were using were effective at controlling the green wingless aphids. But interestingly, we, uh, with uh, the contract managers of British Sugar, are able to monitor the levels of virus in crops. Uh, and have done this for many years, but I thought I would just show you three very interesting uh, slides. This is the level of virus yellows uh, in 2018 recorded at 484 specific field sites uh, at the end of August. And this was the last year of using the seed treatment and less than 1% of the crop was showing virus yellows in that year. In 2019, this was the first year where we didn't use seed treatments and relied on foliar sprays. Uh, and although we did see one or two fields of an increased infection, uh, there were one or two crops where we saw up to 10% virus yellows infection. But this is what happened in 2020. Widespread systematic virus infection Many growers seeing 100% of their crops go yellow very early. The national instance of virus yellows uh, in 2020 was 38%. Uh, yield losses you know, up to 80% in the most severe situations for growers. Uh, and growers really concerned by the fact that they haven't had to see treatments to control virus yellows uh, and struggling with the limited options uh, that we currently have. Now, I said right at the beginning that virus yellows is three strains. Uh, beet mild yellowing virus is the bottom of the leaf blades. The next one up is beet yellows. The third one is beet mosaic that we also saw quite widely in the UK. And the fourth one is a chimera, which is a genetic abnormality. We know that beet yellows is more damaging than beet mild. And unfortunately, last year in the UK, we actually saw up to 65% of the virus isolates, which surprised me slightly, being beet yellows virus. And it just goes to show it's important to understand the different virus isolates as we try and develop future tolerant and resistant varieties of the future, because it's really important that we're able to combat all the different virus strains. Uh, otherwise, uh, if we don't have tolerant and resistant varieties of the future against all of them, then we'll, we'll continue to see epidemics of these virus uh, strains and isolates. Uh, biological control is really important and something uh, that BBRO are concentrating widely. This is a soldier beetle eating a winged aphid uh, in a field in, in the UK. Unfortunately, last year, the beneficial insects uh, came in uh, too late, unfortunately, uh, and so the aphids uh, were uh, already widely uh, in the crop and doing much damage. Uh, so it just shows you the importance uh, of trying to encourage beneficials at the right time. Uh, and it's some work that we're doing with growers, particularly in 2021, about introducing beneficial insects directly into the crop or encouraging them with, with uh, wildflower strips to try and get them to overwinter so that they're at the beginning. Uh, but clearly uh, 2020 has caused many, many challenges, particularly in the UK with virus yellows for all the weather reasons uh, and the rapid buildup of those aphid populations. So uh, the seed treatments had provided growers uh, with tools for 25 years uh, that limited those buildup. We, we are at a situation where we need to be able to provide uh, future solutions uh, and clearly again working right across Europe and in collaboration with colleagues in MBR uh, and, and other countries, particularly France, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, the Nordics, as I said, and Germany. Alternative pesticides, novel pesticides, 
we are working, I'm getting quite excited that there will be tolerant and partially resistant varieties of the future. Sugar beet also has things like mature plant resistance uh, that can be used uh, and we're looking at trying to accelerate that. Biocontrol, we know uh, just like beneficials, it, it, it is a possibility. It just needs fine tuning uh, in, a, in a, a commercial arable situation to provide real long term uh, protection into the future. And hygiene is really essential and something that we're emphasising here in the UK at the moment. Uh, anything growers and agronomists can do to reduce aphid populations and limit the virus sources is really, really important. So, so my last slide, uh, unfortunately, there are few immediate alternatives. But as I said, there is clear work that's been concentrated to try and find those solutions. A greater need for integrated pest management as we go forward and more of a holistic approach using a range of tools uh, and solutions. Uh, interestingly, as many of you are aware, uh, many European countries for 2021, partly because of virus yellows in 2020, have been able to get an emergency authorization for the, the use of neonicotinoid uh, seed treatments in the short term. We have been able to gain that in the UK, uh, but uh, ours is all about uh, around the forecast and we have to get to a certain forecast to trigger it. Uh, and currently we're in a very cold spell of weather here in the UK that actually may mean that we don't use Cruiser in 2021, but we're watching the weather very, very closely. But sugar beet uh, has been a, a very successful crop for all of us in Europe. Uh, clearly we need the tools and technologies uh, and I hope that my presentation has highlighted some of those challenges some of the opportunities, but ultimately an opportunity to use greater integrated pest management for the future to, to prevent these and maintain sugar beets as a very viable crop in the arable rotation in Europe. So many thanks for your attention. And if you have any questions, uh, I'll do my utmost to try and answer them. So many thanks for your attention. Thank you.